All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to College Knowledge, brought to you by the USTA Southern California section. I'm Scott Lipsky. I'm the Director of Player Development and College Readiness for USDA SoCal. Today, we're excited to be presenting a virtual college knowledge program for everybody. Uh, the panel today is made up of college coaches and other experts who will provide important information to prospective college tennis players, parents, and coaches. In the session today, we'll discuss and answer questions about what it means to be a college athlete and the steps that need to be taken to get the ball rolling on recruiting and the admissions process. Um, today, our moderator will be Amanda Fink, a former professional tennis player and All-American at USC from 2005 to 2009. And she's currently a teaching pro at the Santa Luz Club in San Diego. Amanda, it's all yours. Thanks, Scott. I want to thank the USTA SoCal for having me in this panel today. Like Scott said, I got to play tennis at USC from 2005 and 2009, and it was one of the most meaningful times in my career, and that's both personally and as an athlete. I'm still involved in the world of tennis today, but even if I were doing something else, I would definitely say that being an athlete at a school and getting to play a sport there made made all the difference in what I do now for a living and what I could have and anything I would have done elsewhere. We're about developing people and players. When I started coaching, I ran into that would ask about the college recruiting process and different programs. And if, if my child wasn't ready to go to like a huge Pac-12 school, what was going to be the next step? Should I, am I not playing college ever? If you're playing tennis and you love it, you should be able to play in college, no matter what the level. And there are so many opportunities out there. So what we wanted to do is bring together people that know the entire spectrum of college tennis and bring it to you. So college knowledge, I like to think of as the best resource you never had. So what we're going to do is we're going to have three specialists talk about different aspects of college tennis. And then we're going to be having a question and answer, se an answer section with actual college coaches. So what I'd like to start out with is the tennis on campus. I've brought in Justin Yang today, who is the social director of tennis for USTA SoCal. Justin played tennis on campus for UCSD, was a coach there, and has been a service award winner and is obviously a true, true lover of the game. So I've invited Justin to tell us a little about TOC, what it is, and what his experience is like. Hey everyone, I'm Justin. Um... I work for the SCTA as a social tennis coordinator. And about me, a little bit is I've been a player for tennis on campus for two years when I was there as an undergraduate. And after I graduated, I, I was a coach for three years for the team. Um, being a both a player and a coach, I was able to see all kinds of different perspectives on the program. And I realized how great of an asset it is to um, tennis players of all age and all skill levels. And I think prospective college players whether they want to go D1, D2, D3, or just recreational, it's it's like a great environment for them. So what is Tennis on Campus? It's, a, it's an official USTA program on over 400 college campuses around the country. The way they do it in competitive settings is it's a co-ed uh, world team tennis format. The programs are often run by the university students with an advisor that's either your recreational department or sports advisor. Uh, you are considered part of the school so you have all the resources and access to uh, staff and like um, clinics or trainers or facilities it's, it's like you're on the actual team just a step below it um, it offers a recreational environment and a competitive environment uh, it's it's fit for just about anyone who wants to play tennis and keep up with it after graduating high school and you, you really still want to keep playing most major colleges in Southern California have one, and all of them are considered, you know, one of the, they're all top teams in the whole country. Schools like UCLA, USC, uh, most of the CSUs, and uh, they all have competitive TOC teams. Um, the levels of competition we have, uh, it ranges from local casual play and recreational play all the way to national championships hosted by USTA. In the middle, we have U, uh, we have university hosted tournaments for intercollegiate matches where you and your school will send a team to a university and you play against a bunch of other schools and you meet a ton of new people. Uh, it's all skill levels are there. We got schools from Bakersfield all the way to San Diego, all coming together in one place to play tournament uh, for a weekend. 
And then we have sectional championships, which are hosted by USTA. It's where the winners will play and compete and they get to go on to the national championship and represent our section there. And then the biggest event year round is the USTA national championship, which is hosted in huge facilities such as the USTA national campus in Florida or in the West Coast, we have it at Surprise. Um, over there, we have our recent champions are actually UCLA. So just goes to show that like, you can join a school, join a team, and end up being national champions before you know it. We have small invitational events, such as fall and spring invitational, where you get to take your team and fly out to the West Coast or the East Coast and just hang out and play tennis for a weekend. And if you, help, if you win, you get to go to nationals. It's all about having fun, and it's still all about a ton of competition. So what are the reasons you should join? Well, if you want to play on tennis competitively, but you still want to focus on school, it's, it's a great environment. You get to go to your own practices. You get to choose when you want to come. You make, you make friends, you make teammates, and you practice with them on your own, or you can practice with a team. Uh, most teams actually practice twice a week in the evenings. So you go a whole day with your classes, and afterwards you, you finish the rest of the day off with just tennis with your friends. You get to choose your level of commitment and your level of intensity. So whether you want to commit two hours, four hours, or eight hours of tennis a week, you can do that, whatever you want. Um, you get to make friends, which I think is the most important part about tennis on campus in a brand new environment, especially incoming freshmen or transfer students who are new to a school and you don't know anybody, but you play tennis, you can meet a ton of people who are in the same boat and you, your common bond is tennis. And that's what makes it so special. The skill level is just beneath the NCAA and varsity levels in terms of competition. Um, some players are even former NCAA players. We have former Division I players, Division II players, Division III players, and they're allowed to play on this recreational competitive club tennis team. And then they get to compete against other former players even. So who should join tennis on campus? The most important thing is for former junior players who want to focus on school, but still want to play tennis at a high level. After you, you play the junior circuit, you realize you know tennis is not you don't want to follow it in, co in college. So you join a TOC team and you find that all your skills and all your training, it pays off great. People will appreciate all your skill and you take your team to a championship. So what are the benefits of joining tennis on campus? One, you get to meet new people. Two, you get to do community service. A lot of clubs will participate with fundraisers or, or local programs and help either teach tennis or, or go and do collect trash for the community or even help out with unrelated tennis events. Um, it's a great place to network and meet people in your community and make connections. So after you graduate, you have all these people who remember you from helping out with whatever function it was. Uh, another great benefit is the social gatherings and events. One of the biggest things for new, new college students is that you, you don't really know who to hang out with or where you're gonna hang out with. So tennis on campus provides a great environment where on weekends you get to hang out with your friends at karaoke, at dinner, at parties, whatever it is, you get to go together and you get to hang out with your teammates. Another great benefit of tennis on campus is traveling. You're, you're, you get to travel, represent your school at a tournament. You get to stay in hotels with your friends. You get to go play brand new people, meet them again over and over throughout the year. And it allows you to stay competitive in tennis the entire time. Justin, that was a really great description of what tennis on campus is. Um, I know you mentioned that there are athletes that are maybe even former NC2A players that play tennis on campus. Um, what's the skill direction the other way, though? Do people maybe not uh, maybe total beginners, but are there people maybe at the lower levels of tennis, maybe like, I don't know, say juniors that were playing like level sixes up till uh, college that could still feel like they are contributing to a tennis on campus team and having a good time? Yes, yeah, so every single tennis on campus club is different, but most of them have um, all levels from beginners to, to high levels. And even the middle of the group are still able to practice and play in an environment where they feel like they're being challenged, but still can improve. Uh, a lot of schools host inter-team tournaments or even just practice matches with, with themselves. And you, you play no matter what level you are. Even, even the former junior players can find that they'll fit in just fine no matter what level they played at. Mm -hmm. And for your like personal journey through tennis on campus, um, could you have maybe I don't I, with your level of played, could you have played on the varsity team at another school and you chose the school you were at because of academics and played tennis on campus that way? Or what was your personal situation when you were thinking about college and how you weighed 
you know, how tennis was going to play into your college journey? When I first, I was a transfer to UC San Diego, so I came in during my third year. When I was actually at community college, I played one year on the team, and then I actually quit tennis after that one year, and I took an entire year off not playing tennis. But um, during that year off, I I realized about eight months in, I was like, I kind of miss tennis. So when I transferred to UC San Diego, the first thing I did was like look for uh, look for a place to play tennis. And luckily, one of my friends who I played against in high school was on the club team as well, so he invited me to come try out. And it was honestly the most like life changing moment. Uh, like the experience was great. All my friends I still have to this day. I met them through club tennis. Um, I've met you know my former girlfriend was in it. My 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 all lot my closest friends are in it. Um, my level wasn't as high as the NCAA level, but it was still enough where like I felt like you know I get to use all those years of training and all those years of practice, and it actually paid off. I got to play in all the tournaments. Um, it, it doesn't matter that what everyone's you know, situation is different, but mm -hmm. my personal one was that tennis on campus was a pretty much a fit just for my skill level. And then if I know you mentioned that the USTA has helped start a ton of programs. If, if someone's college doesn't have a TOC program, can they start one and how do they do that? So every school has different uh, definitions of what a uh, sports club team can be. So based on the school, you'd have to talk to your administrators and figure it out. But all it requires is that your school recognizes a, a club as a official club for the school and you can participate in any, any uh, tennis on campus events. Um, it's usually you have to write a charter or you just need to get the approval of some administration. Um, but no matter what, UST SoCal is extremely helpful. They, they will help, they'll do everything they can to make you start a TSC club because the more clubs you have, it just, it's just growing our big community. That's great. And do you think, what do you think are the um, things that you're going to take, that you've taken from your tennis on campus experience and been able, like, what are the benefits to how you kind of developed as a person and a player, quite honestly, coming after college? After graduating, uh, the things I learned from tennis on campus was, you know, how to be patient with people, how to, like, understand there's so many different kinds of people out there. Uh, it's, it's learning that, you know, tennis is just a sport, but it's the biggest thing you take from tennis is the people you meet. Um, you gain a lot of friendships from tennis and tennis on campus is like the greatest combination because you go to school and you play tennis and people who are in tennis on campus, they, they struggle with the university life. You know, you got to study, you got to do tests, you got to do homework, and then you still got to practice, you got to play, you got to compete. And all these people, you all have the same background coming, uh, doing your tennis on campus experience. And learning all that, you just you leave school and you just have a, you have an amazing time. That's great. Thank you so much for your time, Justin. That was amazing. So I hope you guys will look into TOC options when you are applying to colleges. Um, so if you're not planning to play for a varsity team or you are dead set on a school and maybe aren't going to be at the level that the varsity team is. Tennis on campus is an excellent way to keep your love of tennis going and to keep tennis a part of your college journey. So next on our panel, I've invited Andrea Tyndall to join us today. Andrea, aside from being a very good friend of mine, is an amazing strength and conditioning coach. Andrea is very well versed with the college scene. She's been involved in programs that are in the Pac-12, the SEC, the the big the big what the, yep the Big Ten. <laughs> Um, so she's she's been involved with lots of sports specific training. She's also been working. She's also worked with pro tennis players with in tennis with Tennis Australia. Um, I personally still work out with her. Uh, she keeps my my rear end in shape. <laughs> um, but again, what's important about Andrea is she really does understand what it takes to perform at the at the top levels as an as a not only just an athlete, but specifically in tennis. Um, athlete uh, Andrea has been working with players of all ages um, and she has a great personality and I really look forward to what she's going to talk to us about today. I love Amanda and I really need to hire her for my PR. Um, and just as much as I kick her butt without her, it'd probably be hard to motivate myself. Um, to give you guys a little bit of background about kind of my story, which is a little bit different than probably most of the people that you're going to hear from on the panel because my introduction into tennis came late and kind of circuitous. Um, I was actually a track athlete uh, through high school, multi-sport athlete, and we didn't have tennis in my high school. I'm from a very, very small town in Southern Oregon where we didn't have a lot of options. So 
you know, I was more of a track soccer volleyball um, type kid. Ended up falling in love at the University of Oregon, going to track and field camps there during the summer. And kind of like we talked about with that tennis on campus deal, I had my heart set. That's where I was going. There was no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, but those that are familiar with track and field know that Oregon is one of the top teams in the country. So I kind of like Justin took a year off because I was like, I, you know, I can't compete at that level. Um, but I knew the coaches and through a series of bizarre events ended up on the team. I uh, was there for two years, um, had the opportunity to train with future Olympians. I learned so much about myself. I, it's insane. Um, learned about what my capabilities are, what my strengths and weaknesses are, both as, as an athlete and as a student athlete and as kind of a human. Um, very similar to Justin, I met some of my best friends through my sporting experience, uh, roommates, um, dating, you know, all of that good stuff. So definitely part of that journey, just in a different environment. Um, and then as I got into kind of my coaching career as a strength and conditioning coach, I would always have a couple teams at each school I went to, and it was pretty much always soccer and tennis were my, my two sports that I had everywhere I went, uh, both men and women. Um, again, definitely at the D1 level from my background with uh, South Carolina, uh, Iowa, Wisconsin, Arizona State. I've also worked with high school athletes, too, uh, at the high at the tennis variation. And then she mentioned uh, with Tennis Australia. And that actually was with their junior program. So I had athletes ages 14 to 19. Um, and I'm not going to drop names, but I guarantee you if I did, you'd know some of those names because they're still on the tour and they make me very happy that I was part of their development um, and getting to see them, you know, just do their thing on the world stage is, is pretty impressive. But equally impressive is all the athletes that I was able to help that maybe went a non-traditional route and used their sport experience to go into coaching themselves, um, use the skill sets and the the learning that they did from learning how to be proactive and how to schedule themselves and just take care, ownership of things uh, into whatever career they ended up going into, whether that was a teacher or a doctor or um, most of my kids are teachers or doctors at this point, but uh, pretty impressive. Um, love every second of it. So again, my tennis experience is now um, occasionally I get to hit with coach Amanda and she gets to work on my backhand, which bless her heart was a big struggle. Um, and it, it's a blast. So the tennis thing, um, again, is excellent. So kind of what I'm going to talk to you guys just a little bit about today is the questions that um, usually come up either when I was out of college and uh, students would be doing their unofficial or official visits as part of the recruiting process or figuring out where they wanted to go. Um, and a lot of questions I get from parents and occasionally an occasional coach. Um, what does it look like at the collegiate level for strength and conditioning or sports performance? We go by a lot of names and it's really dependent on the level that you go to the coach and what their philosophy is, um, the time of year, uh, the resources available at the school. So that's definitely something that, you know, student athletes want to consider as they're starting to look at the colleges that they're going to. Um, in terms of the coach, they, everybody's got a, a philosophy. So, you know, if they're a more hands-on type of tennis coach and they want to do the fitness and they're going to tell the strength coach, this is what you're doing versus someone that's like, build me this, here's your time, you know, come out to the matches if you want. Um, very different in terms of, you know, how much time would be uh, dedicated to strength and conditioning. Generally speaking, and I will talk to kind of the ranges that I've been in, um, sorry, cat coming into the screen. <laughs> um, the levels that I've been at uh, off season, because tennis is a spring sport in the collegiate level, uh, generally speaking, is three days a week lifting off season, three days a week of, we call it conditioning, but it's, you know, fitness, movement, agilities, plyometrics, those kinds of things. Um, and then as the year goes into, there's generally a mini season in the fall that we dial back and it might be to strength, to fitness, while we have those competitions. And then uh, we hit back into the winter off season. Obviously, December, folks go home for winter break. Uh, strength coaches, generally speaking, send home workouts to keep 
the student athletes occupied and focused while they're gone for the holidays. Then they come back, we'll have kind of a preseason, kind of a little bit kickstart. And then as we get into the conference matches, obviously the amount of strength and conditioning time is massively curtailed to accommodate all the competitions. Generally speaking, uh, most of the programs that I was at, I would have them for two days, 45 minutes, um, and I would try to do as much as I could to maintain quickness, plyos, injury prevention, basic uh, strength and power to help them get through the season and maintain as much of that amazing work as we've been doing all year throughout the season. Um, again, depending on the level of school and resource, you may have uh, the strength and conditioning do the fitness per stuff. You may have the tennis coach doing that stuff. So it, again, it really depends on kind of the level uh, and the resources available at that particular school and how many strength coaches they have. Uh, some schools will have, you know, maybe two or three full-time staff, a bunch of grad assistants like that are still in their masters, some interns. So again, it really depends. You might get somebody that um, you know, like I, I'm the head strength coach and here's my GA and my GA is really in charge of your sports and the head coach assists. Uh, so it, again, you might get a different variation there. So, um, that's one of the things I would just kind of say heads up when you're looking at your schools going into it, kind of try to meet your strength coach. Is it somebody that's a full-time staff member? Is it a GA? Uh, you may get lucky enough that you get somebody that has a tennis background but odds are that you're probably not. Um, you may be lucky in that you get a strength coach that is a sponge and wants to learn everything they can about what you do. Um, I had the opportunity, I think they did it payback because I think they were sometimes kind of mean to me, but that's fair, um, where my athletes would take me out onto the court and drill balls at me um, and kind of teach me some things, which was fun, I think, for them. And I, I, I did learn even though they punished me a bit, which was good. Um, so that's kind of what that looks as a general. Um, those are kind of the bigger questions. And again, if you're going at a smaller school, you're going to have maybe different resources. But at the end of the day, if your coaches are good, it doesn't matter what your facility looks like. I have been in colleges where our, our facility was literally on the cover of Sports Illustrated. I kind of liked some of the dirtier ones I was in where it was obvious that people were in there to work, get better, uh, and then kind of be on their way. And it wasn't so pretty. So, again, facilities, how they look are great, but it's really more about the people that staff them. So when you guys are looking at trying to figure out where you want to go and you're looking at the strength and conditioning part of it, um, again, I would definitely make sure it's about the, the people that are involved with you, not the, the shiny bells and whistles on the facilities. Um, and definitely keep an eye out on all of that other fun stuff that you probably don't get now, which is the sports psych, the sports med, the sports nutrition. Those other entities and I, generally speaking, communicated almost every day in regards to our athletes, making sure we were getting them taken care of from every perspective so that they could be the best that they could be uh, on the court. So, um, those are kind of some of the big ones. I'm sure Coach Amanda has some extra awesome questions and I'm not gonna monopolize my ramble. So I'm gonna let her ask away. Okay, so Andrea, thank you. Um, when, so you've talked a lot about, you know, getting ready in the resources that you have with college tennis. When, a, a popular question I'm sure you get a lot is when should kids start that process of adding the, honestly, especially the strength component of, of kind of what you do in their routine to prepare to play for the level that college tennis is. And I actually have kind of a three pronged attack on that question because a lot of times, especially with tennis, because it is an early sports specialization uh, event where kids are just blasting balls really young, they have really high training volume. So while we talk about prepping for college, I actually kind of think right now you're prepping to even you know, compete and maintain your health and sanity, uh, even at younger levels now. Um, so I kind of have three answers to that. Number one is when they're ready. If your kiddo or player says, hey, you know, I'd really like to learn how to move my body better, or I notice that I can't get to those wide angle shots as much, um, what can I do to improve? If they express an interest, 
then yes, all for it. Um, if you want to introduce them because they just don't know the opportunity of what's possible, definitely. But I think as a general rule, when they're ready is the best time to start. Um, the next part of that is when, and I say, I use the term they can commit. If you've got a 13 year old kiddo that wants to train, they're going to require you to get to them to those practices. So make sure that when they want to commit to something that uh, financially scheduled transportation, all of those things are taken into account um, because you wouldn't send a kiddo if you want to have them learn a kick serve. They wouldn't go to a, a tennis pro that specializes in that once every month and expect to get better. So it's the same thing for us. There's a fundamental movement pattern deal that we, we work on as well as kind of getting the strength and the mobility and all those things together. So um, make sure it's something that you guys can do consistently. Uh, and then the third one, and this is kind of speaks to that early sports specialization, is when their technical skills have outpaced their physical development. Because, you know, there's a saying in, in strength and conditioning that, you know, you should be able to squat so much of your body weight before you do plyometrics. I can guarantee you those phenoms at 14 cannot squat two times their body weight and they are blasting things. So when their training volume becomes really high and you want to make sure that they're getting the most out of what they're doing uh, and or like I said, their technical skill is is more than their physical development, like they just don't have the strength to get to things, then that might be a time that I would also introduce it. Okay. Maybe I'll ask you one or two more of these. How how much how important is we talked about kind of the strength and the footwork component? How important is the stretching and flexibility work in junior tennis? I hate to say it always depends, but definitely some athletes are tighter than others. Um, and static stretching is great, um, but I would also say that because our students typically do not do a very good job of warming up the more mo mobility or dynamic flexibility can, can be incorporated into a warm up, the better. Um, one of the other things I have noticed, if you're working with kiddos going through a growth spurt, uh, they lose core strength, they lose balance, they lose coordination, but a lot of times they also lose flexibility. So if you're working with juniors that are doing that, then that will be also considerably more important of a time to focus on because you'd want to make sure that as they're developing and growing, that everything kind of goes together. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Thanks so much, Andrea. That's all really, really great information. Hopefully our junior tennis players will, will hear it and use it because it is a really important part of what is going to make you ready for the, the beast that can be college tennis. Um, and quite honestly, just to be able to compete as a junior athlete. Um, I want to take this time to, to note that our, our college coaches have joined us, which is fun. And our, 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 our D1 athlete, um, Jim, Jim Bodor is here from San Diego Christian College. Uh, Paul Settles from Claremont Mud Scripps is here. Thumbs up. Uh, Evan Perry from Riverside Community College. And our lovely former USC D1 athlete uh, currently on the pro tour, uh, two-time All-American, Danielle Lau. Hi, D. How are you? <laughs> um, so we're going to talk to Sue, and then we're going to ask our college coaches a whole bunch of questions. But thank you again, coaches, for joining us and for, again, to all the panel for joining us. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to, to Sue Hansen. So Sue's piece of this puzzle is super important. Um, Sue is has been has two daughters that I grew up with playing tennis. Both of them got to play tennis for amazing schools. Um, since her daughter's time at college, uh, she's been certified to counsel uh, kids that are are in the pursuit of the college placement process. She's worked with a lot of student athletes. Since then, she's kind of expanded that practice into working with all different kinds of people. I know she's not maybe uh, working one on one with as many student athletes anymore, but has a great deal of knowledge and a great deal of presence there. So I'm really, really um, grateful for her time. I know she has a lot of important information to deliver today, especially with the current times that we are in. Um, so uh, please welcome the awesome Sue Hansen. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for having me here tonight. Amanda, I love giving these or being part of the esteemed panel for the college knowledge sessions. Um, 
college athletics, college tennis is something that's very dear to my heart. Um, it really is one of the best um, programs that our country has to offer. Uh, I think we're probably the only country in the world that has a intercollegiate college athletic program like we do. So it, it really is quite an amazing um, system. Um, like Amanda said, I have since branched out and work primarily now with a uh, low income first generation uh, high achieving students. But um, I always tell my clients or my students that really student athletes and the first gen kids really have a lot in common because they're both two groups of students that colleges really want and really chase after. So it wasn't that um, difficult a switch for me to move to that group of students because they have very similar similar needs. I um, just want to give you a little bit of background about myself because I think it's kind of gives context to really how Byzantine and confusing and really challenging um, college tennis recruiting, athletic recruiting is. Um, people, I don't think, realize it until they get into it that it's it's so nuanced and so complicated. And that's exactly what happened to me. Both my daughters, um, as Amanda said, they played junior tennis around the same time that she did. They were highly ranked national players. Um, and even though they attended a small private school that had an ex excellent college counseling staff, I really felt that the counselors at their school did not have a, a deep understanding of what my kids needed to do to have a good outcome to effectively navigate the, um, the college admissions landscape as a student athlete. So I kind of threw myself into the process. I, at that time, I was a hospital administrator, so I had kind of good organizational skills and research skills. So I was able to, to help them both obtain scholarships to Stanford and University of Virginia. And um, after that happened, it, on kind of like an ad hoc basis, I was kind of besieged by their friends' parents and different people that I knew for um, advice on how to navigate the system. And it was at a time that my healthcare career was kind of winding down. So it was a very easy um, pivot for me to switch careers. I went back and got my credential and started working with, with student athletes in about 2007. And I, I absolutely love it. Um, I, I feel very strongly that um, junior tennis players and their families work exceedingly hard to make this happen. Um, it's a big financial commitment, an emotional commitment, and it really defines your, your life. Um, I can't count how many dinners were eaten in the car and changing into tennis outfits in the car. And every weekend we were at another junior tournament somewhere in Southern California. And this is pretty much the tale of the take for all these tennis families. So the end result is that the proportion of um, junior players that go on to a professional career is, is small. So arguably this, this college piece is the biggest decision that you'll make in your life. And it's, it's important. It, it's most meaningful decision you're going to make in your life for sure. And, so it's important, um, and I think it's a deserved uh, reward for tennis families to have this turn out the way they want it to turn out. And, and that takes a lot of time and, and knowledge. And hence, we have these wonderful um, college knowledge sessions, and hopefully we're, we're contributing to that knowledge base. Um, I could talk for hours on this, but I, I think what I try to do when I give these talks for Amanda is just go through my bullet points. Um, I, I don't get into the coaching recruiting timeline. I leave that to the coaches, but I, I try to focus on the academic piece because that's something that um, I know a lot about and, and the, um, the coaches really know more about the athletic part. Um, let's talk first about college selection. Um, one of the most difficult situations I had as a college counselor when I was dealing with student athletes was that um, most, a lot of times kids wanted to choose a college based on the, the team, the tennis team, and um, the reputation of the tennis team, the coach, the other kids that were on the team, um, which is fine because you obviously, if you love tennis, you want to play your sport in college, but in the end, the, the, you're going to have a job that isn't as a tennis pro. So it's important that you choose a school that has the major that you 
are contemplating majoring in um, has the type of environment that you're looking for, whether it's an all-girls school, whether it's a rural campus, a cosmopolitan campus, whether there's a big Greek scene, um, whether there is, um, if you want a large school where you're going to have classes of three, 400 students, or you're looking at a small college where you're not going to have any classes taught by TAs, you're maybe going to have dinner at your professor's house. So if that's important to you, if you're that kind of kid. So it, it's very, very important to dig deeply into the academic and social environment of the school and have that really take precedence over what kind of tennis program um, the school is presenting. I think that would really be this, the secondary choice. Um, now, obviously, a very important factor is the relevance of your position on the team. In other words, um, a lot of students that I work with were very aspirational. They really weren't capable of or weren't willing, let's say, to assess their tennis skills at the time that we were looking at their recruiting, which usually is around junior year. They were more interested in where they thought they could be by the time they were starting college in the fall, you know, after they graduated high school. And well, that's well and good. You know, I, I, I really think it's important to stress your ability at the time that you're being recruited. Take a look at the composition of the players on the schools that you're looking at and see where you are at that point in time. If you're a three star recruit or a two star recruit or you're a blue chip, whatever you are at that point in time, take a look at those rosters and see where you fall at that time, because you may have one of those great spurts in your ability and you may grow into a position, but more than likely you you probably will be at the ability that you are at the time that you're being recruited. So it's important to choose a program where you are going to get some time to play. College tennis matches, unless they go ahead and, and tweak the um, the format, they're they're long. They're they're several hours, and it's no fun being a bench warmer. If you love tennis, which most kids do if they want to play in college, you know, it's no fun riding the pine and watching your friends play while you, you're warming the bench. And most kids that in my experience that end up in that situation end up quitting. So I think it's very important to choose a program where you know you can be a contributor and play and um, continue to enjoy your sport. Now, um, <clears throat> college admissions years ago, um, college were sort of look, were looking for that well-rounded student. That was sort of, even before my time, that was the way college admissions worked. Well, that has changed dramatically um, in the last 20 years where colleges are looking for a well-rounded class. They're looking for the violinist and the chess player and the student athlete and the um, artistic person and the dancer. And so tennis players really put themselves in a very, very fortuitous position because they are that individual that is excelling in an activity that colleges want to create that well-rounded campus. Um, so you're, there's sort of two ways tennis kids can utilize their skills. And I think the, the first way is the obvious way. The second way doesn't really get the attention that it deserves. And I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, now the first, the first way of course is, is a tennis scholarship. Tennis is just a phenomenal sport for um, college scholarships. Now may, things may change now with everything that's happening in the world, but at least the last few years there, I don't know, between division one, two, three, and NAIA and the junior colleges, tennis is just proliferative. It's it's a, a sport that is represented in every just about every college in our country. And it, I think it's probably because it doesn't really take, it's not that expensive to have a tennis program. You have your tennis courts and some bleachers and a coach and, and there you have it. So um, Kids can get scholarships, especially girls, females, because there are um, eight full scholarships in Division One. I, I think there's six in Division Two, And just about every college in our country has a, a tennis team. In men's tennis, there are 4.5 scholarships per team. And it's an equivalency sport. It's not a headcount sport. And so those scholarships are divided up amongst um, eight or nine students. But it's still a pretty decent situation um, with those 4.5 scholarships. 
So many students, um, many parents want that um, brass ring to them. They, you know, like I said earlier, they put in a lot of time, they spent a lot of money. They want their child to have a full ride scholarship or even a partial scholarship. And that is the primary goal, the end goal. And um, sometimes that is to the detriment of the quality of the school. They, they just want that scholarship. And I certainly don't have a problem with that, but in my practice, and a lot of the students that I saw over the years, I had many parents that really were um, very interested or very covetous of some of our highly selective schools in this country, our Ivy Leagues, our highly selective liberal arts colleges, the Swarthmore's, Williams, Claremont's, Pomona, uh, Amherst, Haverford, um, and all those schools um, are extremely difficult to be admitted to. They have a very high bar academically. And um, student athletes get a very big break in admissions. We call that an admissions advantage. And I thought that was just a wonderful um, result or we want wonderful sort of side advantage to having spent all these years playing junior tennis and then at the end to be able to get to gain admission to some of the best colleges in our country um, because you're you're a student athlete. Um, obviously at these schools you have to be one or two standard deviations below what a, nor a regular student would need to get into these schools, but you still are getting somewhat of a break both in the SAT and in your GPA. So I think um, that was something that I really valued, that I was very excited to help families gain admission to some of these selective colleges and uh, or the kids, uh, the students, to gain um, admissions um, because of their, uh, their tennis ability. So that's another great benefit, especially for the boys who don't have as many scholarships. They don't have the eight headcount scholarships. They have the equivalency scholarships. So some of those D3 Ivy League admissions are were, were really nice and very rewarding for me as a counselor to see that happen. Um, the other thing that I like to discuss, and I think this is probably more relevant than ever because so many folks are struggling right now financially, is sometimes the financial aid that is offered by these the Ivy Leagues and the highly selective liberal arts colleges Sometimes that's even better than the athletic scholarships on the boys side, because um, first of all, I think many more folks are going to qualify for financial aid now because of what's happening with, with the COVID epidemic pandemic. And because of that, there, as long as we continue with intercollegiate athletics, there's significant financial aid at these schools for families that qualify. So sometimes those financial aid awards even exceed um, what some of the boys can get in terms of a partial athletic scholarship. So I think that's a really worthwhile road um, to pursue. Um, but again, I think the most important or, you know, the overriding goal for me when I was doing this with student athletes was to keep your eye on the ball, to really think about the fact that as much as you were a great junior tennis player and it, it, it really defined your childhood and you're going to play in college, at the end, you're going to have a career that is not as a professional athlete. And that's not just tennis, that's all sports. So it's very important to be smart and strategic about your college choice. Use this skill that you spent so many years working on and defining and use that to uh, position yourself in a way that you get to choose the college that's, that's a perfect fit for you. I mean, because again, this is arguably the, the most important decision you're going to make in your life. It is life changing where you go to college. And um, I think as athletes, as tennis players, you really have a chance to put yourself in a great position. Um, I'm not going to get too much more in, into detail about timelines. There's very, very specific uh, recruiting timelines that need to be followed. Um, NC2A Clearinghouse, when you can talk to coaches, when you can't talk to coaches. I, I, Things have gotten so complicated in details. I, I kind of like to leave that to the coaches, just, but just like to add that follow the rules, um, go on your official visits when you can go on them and go on unofficial visits if you can afford to do them, but follow the rules. And then um, I think one more thing that I think is important to talk about because so many tennis players are homeschooled. Um, think about the context. 
Think about the fact that if you are homeschooled, the admissions staff really doesn't have con a contextual comparison for your curriculum. They don't have your high school to compare with other students because you're not in a high school. So for these kids, for if you are a homeschooled student, it's very important that you take standardized tests and that you do well on the standardized tests and that you take them early so that the coaches have something that they can bring to admissions so they can give you that early read. And because of what's going on with COVID, um, the spring SAT tests have been canceled. The next test is scheduled for August 29th. We're hoping, we all of us in college admissions are hoping that that happens because we all feel that SAT is the one consistent comparison that um, admission staff can use. So we, we do hope that that happens, but for our student athletes, for our tennis players, even more so, or even for our underrepresented minorities, it's really important that you take that test and that you do well on that test because you're going to need that context, especially this year when a lot of high schools have gone to pass fail. Um, kids that are homeschooled really need to have that SAT exam so that they can show context. So I think I'm going to let Amanda ask some questions if she'd like and then move on to the coaches. Sounds good. So, Sue, when you were talking about weighing, weighing the importance of, you know, pay, making sure you're going to school that has the right academics, because um, whether you're going to be playing your sport just in college, after college for a while, at some point, you're going to want to make sure that you have a valuable degree um, to use later on in your life. Um, when people are searching and making kind of deciding those priorities, of where they're going to be, you know, I think that besides the academic portion, there's also just, you know, feeling successful in college because you like the look, you know, you're in a place that you like to be, there's a lot that goes into it. Do you think based on your, what you've found with people that you've worked with, um, do you think that the, their priorities have been, have people been happier based on the location they've picked? Is it, has it been, you know, mainly around the academic program or the sport, or does it really depend on the person? Or is there just a more popular thing that you find that people have more success of where to start with your priorities? Um, I think the students that I've worked with over the years that prioritized the acad are you talking about student athletes now? Correct. Right. I, I think the student athletes that I've worked with are happier when they've chosen a school that really fit their personality and their academic profile than they were about the athletic piece. More, more students that I knew transferred because of unhappiness, social unhappiness, academic overreaching than they did because they weren't happy with the tennis team. And I also know that you mentioned earlier, there's obviously some kids that have a pathway of going through traditional schools and some do the homeschool route. Um, we had a parent submit a question that said, you know, I found out through the homeschool route that our school, you know, isn't NCA approved, um, you know, the high school, you know, year in, in I'm, you know, I'm in senior year, what do I do is the answer to something like that, you know, taking a gap year and figuring it out or what advice would you have for someone in that situation? Yeah, um, sometimes you can talk if this person's very, very highly ranked and maybe a blue chip recruit, you know, sometimes you can talk to the coach and the coach can talk to their admissions liaison, um, you know, every things are very highly scrutinized now because of varsity blue. So uh, I think um, even if those conversations are above board, they're probably more difficult conversations to have. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes if at admissions looks a little deeper into the curriculum description, they may find that that is an NCAA approved course when it looked um, outwardly didn't look like it would be. But mm -hmm. a lot of times kids have to take a gap year. And I think that's why I think it's very important when you start high school that you're doing a, an accredited homeschooling program that it matches up with the NC2A required courses so that you're not caught with that situation. Mm -hmm. and, and then for, for, for people that are considering, you know, their, their options uh, financially at schools, like you said, you know, not all the time can you get a full scholarship. Is there potential for having partial athletic help and partial academic help? Are there opportunities there? And in that vein, is there a different approach that student athletes should be taking or expecting to, like you mentioned earlier, the Ivy League schools versus 
the other schools, which seem just to have different pathways in, in what you should expect. Well, I mean, if a student is, you know, a, a kid who's close to a 1300 on SAT, um, has taken very rigorous college prep AP classes and done well in those classes, uh, and it, it's a, a boy, you know, because again, the males don't get have as many scholarships as, as females. Um, some of those kids really pursue the Ivy Leagues because they they can get financial aid sometimes a full financial aid package based on the family's income at an Ivy League school, whereas if they were at a, a boy at a D1 program, maybe get looking at a third of a scholarship, a half scholarship, maybe just books. So mm -hmm. um, I think for strong students, the Ivy Leagues and the small liberal arts programs are very, very strategic decisions to make. Um, there are you can mix and match athletic scholarships, academic scholarships. I know USC is a school that does that. Northwestern does that. But the academic scholarship is has very, very specific criteria in order to meet that partial scholarship. There's that has to have a certain GPA. And uh, I'm not sure about the SAT score, but they, the NC2A wants to ensure that that's not sort of side door financial uh, scholarship money. They want to make sure that that student is really legitimately getting an athletic scholarship to compensate for their partial athletic scholarship. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I think that's important to know. I don't think a lot of people understand kind of what goes into like the qualifications of those things and how they can be combined or not combined. Right. Um, and people run into trouble that way. Um, but thank you so much, Sue. That has been super valuable information. I really hope people use it. And honestly, I think the message that you've sent more than ever is, you know, research. Obviously, you guys are getting a great tool today by getting to listen to it kind of, you know, for lack of better words from the horse's mouth. But um, I know a lot of the coaches have already started to send me uh, sites and material. A lot of material is accessible online now. If you have a question, you can Google it. And, and as long as it's on a site that is reputable, you can't, a lot of it is accessible. Um, so hopefully you will do your research before you start your college search. Thank you so much, Sue. And thank you to Sue, Andrea, and Justin in general, our kind of specialists here. Um, your time is greatly appreciated. I know you guys are even in this time very busy. And so to volunteer your time to talk about your kind of role in the college experience and your knowledge is truly appreciated. Um, so now we're going to transition over to our superstar coach lineup here uh, to get some knowledge from them about their particular programs and maybe some overall experience in the, the college recruiting pathway. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'll kind of go through each of the coaches, introduce them, and I would love each of the coaches to tell us about what their program is, um, if they have scholarships available, uh, what their UTR level is like. And then when we get to Danielle, I'm probably gonna ask you a couple questions about what D1 tennis is like, and we'll go over kind of those aspects of what, what a D1 uh, school looks like. So first I wanna introduce, let's, Let's hang out with Paul Settles. So Paul is at Claremont Mud Scripts. Um, Paul is a superstar in all aspects of the word. Paul has been NCA title matches in the past seven years, which is incredible. Um, he helped his school win the first NCA title in any sport, which is quite the thing to have in the books. But not only is Paul a phenomenal coach, but he's been involved in other parts of the industry in junior tournaments, um, even involved with the ATP um, and, and bringing tennis to kids in school. So Paul has a really well-rounded understanding of what it means to be involved in tennis. Um, and he runs a phenomenal program that I cannot wait for you to hear about. So Paul, can you tell us a little bit about Claremont Mud Scripts? Yeah, thanks for having me, Amanda. It's great to, to be on with everybody. And uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm the head coach at a small liberal arts college uh, in Claremont. If um, many of the viewers have probably played at the Claremont Club in Claremont, uh, which is opening on June 1st, by the way. Um, and um, so we're about a mile from the Claremont Club. Um, as I said, it's a consortium of, of five colleges, uh, Claremont McKenna College, Harvey Mudd College, Scripps Colleges are the three that, that come into our athletic program. Um, each college is about a thousand students. 
uh, Scripps, all female. Uh, Harvey Mudd College is uh, math, science, engineering based. And Claremont McKenna is more traditional liberal arts college, but with a focus on sort of the practical side of liberal arts. Um, we compete in Division Three, um, uh, and we're, as Amanda said, we're we're at the top kind of a, of Division Three. We've been ranked in the top three in the nation for most of the part of the last decade. Um, and I would I would sort of characterize uh, the top level of Division Three as as um, comparable with kind of the mid major Division One level. Um, so, um, from a UTR point of view, um, our players are between 11 and a half and 12 and a half. Uh, sometimes we're bumping up into the 13s uh, with our top few players. Um, when some of our players uh, arrive on campus, they can be a little bit uh, less than an 11, maybe a high 10, something like that. That gives you an idea of the level, but it's, uh, it's quite strong. And um, as I said, it's a non-scholarship program, but still the level is, is quite high. Um, and uh, I liked what Susan said earlier in her talk just about um, at the Division three and small call and, and liberal arts uh, college level, lots of times the financial aid packages are just as strong as the athletic scholarship packages at some of the Division one and Division II uh, institutions you'll be looking at. So, and we're one of those schools where um, we are what is known as, um, as need blind in admission. Uh, so that means that uh, if you are admitted, um, you are, um, all of your financial aid uh, needs are met uh, no matter what, and that's guaranteed for your four years of, uh, of being matriculated um, at one of the colleges that feed into our program. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's CMS in a nutshell. Great. Um, that's awesome. So we look forward to finding out more about that. And then next I want to introduce Jim Boder, who's, um, right here in San Diego with me at San Diego Christian College. Uh, Jim is also involved in other, you know, aspects of tennis. He has in the past served on, you know, a San Diego district board. He, I see him at all the major tournaments. Um, Jim is a great personality and individual overall. Jim, can you tell us a little about what an NA school is? And again, the kind of logistics about your program? Sure, thanks, Amanda. Uh, yes, my name is Jim Boder. I'm the head coach for the men's and women's team at San Diego Christian College. We're a small Christian college located in Santee, uh, which is kind of East County, San Diego. Uh, we're a school of about five to 550 uh, students, about 400 on ground, about another 150 or 200 or so online. Um, and uh, we are a scholarship giving program. Uh, we've been pretty strong in our tennis program since its inception. We're in our fifth year, sixth year, going into the sixth year. Um, I came into the program four years ago as an assistant coach, a volunteer assistant coach, um, and have since morphed into the head coach. Uh, we have five scholarships in the NAIA uh, that we can do. We are uh, an equivalency scholarship program in the, in the NAIA, so I can give institutional aid up to five fulls based on how big my roster is. So if I have a small roster, obviously I can give a little bit more. Uh, if I expand the roster, which I've done lately, just to be able to help protect from injuries and all that, then you have to be able to divide it up a little differently. Um, so we, we don't stack at San Diego Christian College. So I know Susan had talked about that and I know that there's various programs out there, but uh, you can come in strictly on uh, academic merit. If you have a GPA of over 3.5, you can get uh, an academic scholarship up to $14,000. But if you're an athlete and you have good uh, good grades, you can't take that 14,000 and then I give you a different number and, and add them together. So we just give one number uh, out. So that's a good question to ask when you're talking to coaches to if they actually stack their scholarships because that's gonna be a big thing when it gets to financial aid. Um, so that's, um, that's pretty much, there's about 116 schools I think that compete in the NAIA. Uh, most NAIA schools are probably under about 1,000 to 1,200. Uh, most all your small Christian colleges are going to be uh, in the NEI unless they're, you know, there's a lot in the D3 where Paul's at. Um, but it's a great program, very aggressive. Um, it's very high level of tennis. We range 
from 12-4 down to our lowest UTR is 9-5, but playing on the roster, though we're between 12-4 and 11-6, going right. into the fall on the men. And we're about nine on the high end for the women, down to about a seven uh, on the low side of the women. So the women were ranked 10th in the nation when the season ended, the men were 18. And uh, so it, it's been a strong program, we've been blessed. That's great. Thank you so much, Jim. And then Dilau. So Danielle played uh, for USC and graduated in 2013. So she has a really good feel on the level of what it takes to play for, you know, a huge school like USC. Um, so I I have the statistics, I think, for for the so the level about for you know a, a big a big a women's on the women's side at least for a school like you like a, a UCLA, USC, like in, in the Pac 12 is about a range from 10 about 10 2 to 11 8. Um, maybe some of the smaller mid-range is between a, a nine and ten. Um, so Danielle, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, your kind of coming into USC, what it took for you kind of in the junior ranks, like how, how well do you really need to be doing or how to be seen by a college like you played for? Yeah, so uh, we didn't have UTR back when I was competing, but we did have tennis recruiting. And I was, uh, I, I believe I was a blue chip, maybe the top, uh, I think around like five in the class. I think I was probably or maybe around like three or four. So it, it's, um, it, it was still, it's super competitive. And sometimes it's just, it just depends on how many slots are available to the school you're wanting to get into. Um, and and yeah, so I, I guess like to to answer your question, like it's it's a little bit of luck, but at the same time you do need to have that that reputation and um, and you need to have the results too. At the time I wasn't playing and and chasing points across the nation. I played probably the bigger super nationals uh, that were closer to me, Easter Bowl, the Carson ITF and such. And because Southern California is such a dense and strong section, it's, um, as long as you had pretty good results and the coaches can take notice of your results, you're okay. So ranking back then wasn't a, that big of a deal. I didn't chase points to build a national ranking. I was more focused on like the quality of my results. Um, I'm not too sure how points and rankings work nowadays. I'm not sure what is the point system. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it'd be hard for me to advise on that. But uh, back, back when I was playing and when I was getting recruited, it was, it was important to beat other blue chips and beat other five stars, um, mm -hmm. beat quality players. And um, yeah, that, that's what it really came down to in order to, to build your stock to, to get to in the college you wanted to go to. Mm -hmm. So you were playing kind of, a, it was it was more of a of a the ITF international scale, but if you were playing kind of like the net, you would at least need to be playing like the, the big level one national tournaments here and not only playing yes. them, but doing well. You don't have to win all the tournaments per se, but you, you kind of have to, you know, show that you're making a showing in these upper level tournaments to be considered yes. for a program like, like, you, like you had played for. Yeah, yeah, for for sure. I, I think um, actually uh, it's coming back to me a little bit. <laughs> it's been a while thinking, but uh, I thinking about level one, level two, level three nationals. I felt that my other peers that were competing for my spot, they were cons they maybe won at least one level three national. Yeah, like at least like they they at least had one or two titles mm -hmm. go you know to to be considered. Mm -hmm. um a, a worthy recruit for for yeah a, a top college close to where you are gotcha all right mm -hmm. and i want to bring it to my friend evan perry uh my friend evan has just recently taken over the program at at riverside community college but has been kind of a staple in tennis he's he's the director of i tennis riverside um has coached high school tennis again just i i 
I didn't say this at the beginning, but I'm going to say it now. This is probably one of the most well-rounded panels I've probably ever had in a college knowledge, not only because of the different divisions of tennis that are covered, but just of the backgrounds of the individual, the amazing wealth of knowledge between the, the four of you is, is really incredible. So this is going to be an amazing panel. Um, Evan, can you tell us a little bit about Riverside Community College and maybe just the general benefits of what, it, you know, of playing for a community college? Sure. Um, thanks for having me, everyone. Good to see everyone, familiar faces and some new ones. Um, yes, like Amanda said, uh, actually my first year was a very strange year. Um, <laughs> not expecting this, but um, I'm the head men's coach at Riverside City College. Um, we are located in the heart of Riverside, California. We have over 20,000 students, commuter school. Um, we are part of both the junior college um, equivalent of NCAA, but also the California um, Community College uh, Athletic Association. And so this is comprised of, if, if there's a community college with an athletic program in the state of California, we're all a part of it from Southern Cal all the way up to Northern Cal. So um, we also compete against some non-conference opponents uh, from D3, D2, NAIA. Um, the academic programs are solid because a lot of them flow into the UC or the CSU systems. So I talk a lot to some of these guys um, and other four-year college coaches. When my players are done their second year, they're looking for a place to finish up. And so um, tuition is very affordable. I think uh, in-state is about 3,500 a year, um, out of state, that would be, I think, probably double. And then our international students, I have a good mix. I have like kind of half and half, maybe 60, 40 uh, American to international players. And so a lot of the international players will come the junior college route. And so that's been a, a cool experience for me. Um, let's see, level-wise, uh, I was really blessed with an amazing number one player. Um, he just committed to a uh, mid-major D1 school, and he's about 11.7 UTR. And then I find the trend is pretty common in the junior college is you have a t like really strong top two or three, and then maybe most of my four, five, and six are in that like nine UTR range. Um, but again, it's, it's definitely competitive tennis. I think a lot of students that contact me directly, um, they're looking for more opportunity to compete, develop their game more, maybe even increase their, their GPA to potentially transfer to a, a school to finish their degree. So it's, um, it's definitely a, a route that I think is a positive option for a lot of people um, and also connects to a lot of the, uh, you know, my fellow coaches on the panel to transfer into an NAI or NCAA school once they complete their second year. That's great. All right, so now that we've kind of introduced everyone, we'll jump into some questions. And this is a combination of questions that I think it commonly asked uh, by parents and coaches uh, in the junior tennis world and ones that they've actually sent in to us in advance. Um, so question, question one is, ideal and latest time during the junior or senior year in high school that division one scholarships are allocated. So when I, I take that as kind of knowing when the signing period is, um, as far as I know, unless there's been any, any I mean, again, the situation we find ourselves in is a little different, but usually the signing period, at least for D1, uh, began in, in November and goes through August. Um, because the second part of that question is if you are a senior in high school and you are finishing, is it too late to be able to get a scholarship? And the answer is no. Um, things happen all the time. Things are constantly changing. There are transfers. Things are happening. But I would say that it is better to be prepared than not prepared. This process does not begin in senior year for most people. Okay, This is something we are thinking about. Um, as we are start, I mean, in our early stages of high school, freshman, soft, sophomore year, really, um, and then really engaging kind of in the process junior year. But let's see, would uh, Paul, is there anything else that you would kind of add to that? The signing period, I think, might be different for different divisions. 
Um, yeah, no, with respect to division one, about the only thing that I would say uh, add to that, I think you're right, is that, you know, now you're starting to see some late signers um, actually enter in the spring season, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of, instead of matriculating in September, which is sort of the traditional time, um, lots, of, lots of these programs at the D1 level are taking student athletes to start in January. Uh, and that allows you to buy a little extra time, for example, if you're, um, you know, if you're a senior in high school and haven't made a commitment. Mm -hmm. So we, we are starting to see some of that. Um, with, uh, with respect to my level, and I think most of the, most of the small college level, which is represented on, on this meeting, um, you know, oftentimes uh, our sort of commitments uh, are being made uh, late. Uh, and by late, I mean uh, fall of, of senior year in high school. Okay. Um, certainly those, you know, th those discussions begin a lot earlier, but um, a lot of uh, my commitments of advocacy for applications are happening in the first part of October. Uh, they may start as early as uh, the summertime, but uh, we're usually wrapping things up by first week in October. Got it. And then I want to be able to address this early on. Obviously, this year is different than any other year. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, I think, especially, you know, in the whole tennis community right now. And a lot of people, including coaches, want to know, based on the situation, if there's anything you can comment on in regards to, because of COVID-19, because of the, you know, the NC2A releasing that seniors can are able to return uh, pending on the school, um, what would you say, is there anything that you can comment on on the current situation, how that will affect recruiting and the kind of the class of 2021 and beyond? Um, Jim, do you have anything that you can add to that? Sure. Um, yeah, obviously, this is this is a really interesting year uh, with COVID-19. Um, I'm getting bombarded more than ever this year just because I think the, a lot of players are uncertain of where they're going to play and they're feeling that sense of anxiety of just trying to land somewhere. Because I'm probably actually talking to some players that I normally wouldn't be talking to skill level wise, um, just because they're trying to land somewhere. Um, so obviously there's a lot of uneasiness going on out there in the industry. Um, I also sit as a vice president of the college. So I see the executive and the, and the educational side on top of the school. So I'm in meetings 10 to one on that side, just to be able to address the social distancing you know, the, the spread of the disease is all the density related. So how classrooms are going to be, you know, addressed, transportation, all that inside the programs are all very real questions uh, that you have to ask this year because the bottom line is we have to keep the kids safe. Um, from the NAIA standpoint, um, you know, we're suffering probably some of the same issues that the NCA is too, is that, you know, SATs and ACTs aren't being offered. Uh, 16 of my 20 kids are internationals. So there's no TOEFL scores being uh, administered out there. So they're having to transfer to IELTS testing, which that's not always available. I have a Croatian student that can't get that test done right now. So there's a lot of things that are forcing the process late in the season for me. I actually just got assigned LOI yesterday. So, I mean, and, and that's for the fall. So we still have mm -hmm. to get them on playnai.org, get them eligible, do all that process. If they're coming in as a freshman, that process is easier at least than a, than a transfer. But um, it, it's it's a different environment this year for sure. I mean, there's a lot yeah. of questions. We're getting a lot of inquiries from the parents, and are we actually going to show up on campus in August? I think the NAI hasn't finally hasn't done a final ruling yet. We're supposed to know something, I think, by June first at the latest. But as it stands now, we are going to play fall sports. It's probably not going to be a full season um, for us, at least in tennis. The only thing we have to deal with is our ITA regional tournament. And so for mm -hmm. us, we're playing the last week of September, first couple of days of October. Hopefully we're gonna be out of this by this point, we can get that in and then still play our nationals in Georgia in November. Um, but you know, they're talking about it, it refiring up again in November, December, and maybe having to be, you know, back on home, home quarantine again, maybe. So there's just so many unanswered questions. So I would say the sooner mm -hmm. you can get working with your coaches and, and, and identifying where you wanna go is paramount right now because the time Time clock is ticking, even though there's a lot of unknown variables out there. Mm -hmm. Paul, would you have anything to add from the standpoint of the NC2A? 
Um, no, I think, you know, that was a really comprehensive answer from, from Jim. Um, you know, the, the one thing I would say about our sport, we're lucky. I mean, we're not having the same conversations that football and basketball are having right now. Um, and, uh, you know, tennis is a sport that lends itself to social distancing and, and, uh, you know, playing in a healthy way. So when, you know, when we return to action, I think it bodes well for our sport. And I think there's, there should be some peace for everybody uh, in all that. The other thing I would say is that, you know, depending on the institution, um, you know, the, the future of tennis will sort of depend institution by institution, division by division. Um, and uh, everybody will have sort of a different approach to this. But but I'd like to think that tennis is in a really strong position because, um, as Susan said earlier, you know, it's relatively uh, inexpensive to operate, um, and it translates into some incredible life skills uh, later on that I think college administrators and college presidents uh, value and recognize. Yeah. And Evan, is this affecting you in the community college world for Riverside City? Well, I think it's actually um, a kind of a it's it's kind of weird to really describe fully and articulate, but with granting eligibility back, their student of eligibility, I have players that were getting ready to go finish their bachelor's degree, and all of a sudden they're like, "Well, I might as well just come back because everything's unknown right now," um, and so. For me, I just encourage them. Like I said, I, I had one player, he committed, and he committed late, and he committed to a mid-major D1 program. Um, and then I have another one of my top three players. He's thinking of moving on. You know, he did his two years of tennis, and he's going to do his start his career, finish up at a four-year school. And now he's considering coming back because he gets his eligibility back. And you know, like Jim and Paul and every other college coach, we didn't get to finish our season. And I think some players were, were wanting to do that. Um, mm -hmm. It was a little bit bittersweet, um, to, you know, despite the fact that this is unprecedented. So um, I say that. And uh, as far as, you know, I've been talking with a lot of college coaching friends during this time at all levels. And, and there's a lot of opportunity there. You know, you, you especially, you know, Paul and Jim both mentioned um, their players are looking for, for places to land. And I think that they're casting a larger net than maybe if mm -hmm. they were the traditional coming right out of high school. These are my three top schools. I'm not going anywhere else, not considering any other ones. Um, I think that that has definitely changed. Yeah. So looking forward from all of this, presuming that we come out and everyone's ready to go, <laughs> we're back. Um, I want to talk about the things that you guys as coaches look for. Obviously, you have to look for, you know, the the talent level of the player and the level they compete at. Will they be able to compete to the level of, you know, what, what you guys are seeing with your team? But I wanted to ask you each what what you look for in addition to the actual level um especially just from danielle from knowing the the players you know that were on your teams um and knowing kind of who was brought into that you know kind of special family what what do you think that you know the coaches of a program like yours are, are looking for in addition to obviously can someone play or are there things that are more important than can someone play I think, you know, for me, and I, I know Evan and, and Paul really well. I grew up playing against Paul for years, and, and I know the quality of the coaches that they are. I think all of us want to have a good culture more than anything. You know, you got to make sure that whatever you put together, that the guys can get along. Tennis is a very competitive sport. It's a very individual sport played as a team, so it's very easy to get egos out of whack. And, and, uh, and then once you kind of have a few of those that aren't working together, that can take down the whole – you know, the whole team. So for me, I spend an awful lot of time when I'm recruiting, um, just, you know, with a lot of Skype calls, getting to know them, talking about things other than tennis, want to know a lot about their family. I spend a lot of time, I talk with their parents a bunch, um, cause I want to make sure that that support network works, you know, especially with having so many internationals on the team. I mean, I'd love to have more Americans, but they just tend to not uh, want to come you know, to an NAI school. But I, I am their parent. My wife and I are their parents while they're gone. And so I need to make sure that they have a level of trust with me, 
um, I know what they're all about uh, and that I can, you know, extend the values that they have and then they understand the values and the expectations that I have for my program. So I spend a lot of time in that. Um, I obviously prefer good grades. I don't want to have to have to be chasing somebody all the time, barely being able to stay eligible from a grade standpoint. So that's important. Um, I, I am a big believer in student athlete in that order. Um, just I think as Susan mentioned, you know, all of us wanted to play tennis and, and earn a paycheck and that doesn't always happen. And if it does, uh, it doesn't always last as long as we want it to. And so you have that education is important for being able to take care of your future wife and kids um, or husband and kids. And uh, so I really make sure that they're choosing the college also for the education that they're going to get and that being able to advance them in life. I mean, mm -hmm. we're going to have a ton of yeah. fun hitting tennis balls and, and competing at the highest level, but I also want to make sure that they graduate. Um, sure. You know, it should be a fun example. So that's, I, I think that's probably what I focus on the most. I just, I kind of want to know who they are mm -hmm. when the chips are down. And then, you know, obviously the tennis side speaks for itself. I know exactly what I'm looking for and what level I have to be at to be able to compete. Um, but I think some of those other incidentals are what's really important. Yeah. Obviously, being in a Christian and, college, too, they have to have a foundation in faith to, you know, to go to San Diego Christian College, too. So I have certain parameters that I have to work into that, that mm -hmm. maybe somebody else doesn't. But it's all good. Mm -hmm. It's a good environment. Yeah. And Danielle, so for you, like playing at, you know, a school like yours, obviously, you've seen kind of the teams that have come into your program being there um, and the kinds of people that are kind of being brought into that kind of fam that 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 environment honestly. Um, what do you think are the kinds of things that that coaches at huge schools like the ones you played for are looking for in addition to can they play? Um, Paul, can you tell us what, what does it mean to be a walk-on and how does that situation work for a school? Yeah, well, I guess in theory first at, at my level, division three, everybody's a walk-on because there's no athletic scholarships. Um, but uh, no, you're, you're right. Um, you know, I, I, I think at, uh, at all the levels of college tennis that we're talking about, um, there are recruited spots for a team and there are unrecruited spots and those unrecruited spots are, are filled by what we call walk-ons. And typically in, in our situation, you know, we'll recruit for a certain number of, of spots on our team. We'll basically have an idea of what our roster looks like. Um, and then out of the blue, one of us uh, coaches will get an email from somebody who says, hey, I know you didn't recruit me coach, but uh, I played four years of high school tennis. 
Uh, I was really good. I was all league. I played, you know, four USTA tournaments over the summer and got to the final of a level four. You know, um, we'll get that type of email that basically says, hey, I can really play, uh, but you didn't recruit me. And in, in those situations, I think, you know, um, we are inclined to say, great, uh, come on down. Um, we'll arrange a tryout for you. Um, to see how you mesh with our team and how you compete with the guys that are on the roster um, and see how that goes. Um, it looks a little bit different on every campus with every program. Sometimes it's an open uh, sort of casting call for walk-ons. In other cases, it's, uh, it's one or two people that you might get an email or a text from who, who you think might have some potential. Mm -hmm. um, but I think almost every program um, provides an avenue for walk-ons. There aren't many that, that do not. Right. And I think also, too, sometimes at the bigger school, like even, <clears throat> even if you're a walk-on, you're still getting to travel with the team sometimes. You're still getting the gear. There's still probably a lot of benefits to imagine um, aside from the, you know, the possibility of, of just playing. But you still get some of the benefits of, and feeling like you're involved with the team. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I guess the one question to ask coaches, if you're in that situation, contemplating being a walk on is to find out, you know, how many roster spots there are available, because a lot of the programs are, are um, constrained by by budget and number of roster spots. So it's important just to to understand that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so Bill, if someone, it, um, Jim, I'm sorry, goodness gracious, I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> Jim, if someone is trying to, you know, seek a scholarship on a, on a women's team, um, would you say that if a, if a player is only really interested in full scholarships as opposed to partial scholarships, is that something that is appropriate to ask a coach about kind of upfront in the recruiting process? Or is that seen as kind of a, um, a faux pas or just completely rude to do? Well, that's a great question. I've had to answer this question before. And so I've had a lot of time to think about it since the last time I answered it. Most of my international students or anybody that's a five-star, um, I had a few of those that I was able to recruit this last year. Um, you know, your level of play is going to determine obviously what you can get. We are limited and bound, especially being a small school. We still have to, we still have to survive. We still have to make some money, um, and we do have the constraints that the NAI puts on us on how much I have to play with. So we have, uh, we can give full scholarships. Um, I can give institutional aid up to five fulls. I would have a short roster if I were to give five fulls out. So I have to be able to play, um, you know, I have to be able to build a team that has uh, the able to support and be able to support an athlete who maybe gets injured, still have a quality player come in and field an entire roster. So most of my international students, when they cut a recruiting video and I see it, usually the first line out is they're looking for a full scholarship. And, and that's okay. I have been doing this long enough now that I just expect to hear that. Um, I will still reach out to them if I like their video. And I think that based on how they deliver their message of who they are, um, I look at their personality a lot when they're delivering it. And then I watch the energy level when they're playing on top of their skill set. And then I'll reach out and talk to them because I still have to get to know them and they still have, I know that they still have to fit my culture to be able to give them a scholarship. So nothing's off the table for me. If they meet all of my criteria, playing wise, culture wise, you know, the, they fit within the culture of the college and everything else and they're worthy of it. And I have the room and the budget for it. I would give them, you know, I would give them a full scholarship. So I wouldn't say that, you know, nothing's off the, nothing's off the table on that. Good to know. I think you have to be uh, flexible as a coach. That's great. Good. Uh, so Evan, we've another popular debate um, when it comes to kind of the pathway to college tennis is the kids that are doing the traditional high school route through the kids that are, are choosing to do homeschool. Um, have you seen kids come up through the pathway that have been in either route and be successful? Or do you have an opinion on that? Like the kids that have that that come to college that that have gone through one route or the other? Yeah, I think, I mean, I even coach, you know, both high level juniors that are still doing the traditional on their high school team, you know, having a lot of success, enjoying that. Um, and then, you know, one of my students just committed. She did the whole traditional high school process and now she's playing division three tennis next year. Um, and I have a student who's 
you know, just switched to homeschool. So I think we see uh, it comes down to the athlete, obviously, it comes down to what their goals are. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of what I see, um, I think I think the traditional route is what I typically uh, receive at the junior college level. Um, and then a combination similar to Jim of uh, lots of uh, interest from international players. Um, I think at the junior college level, if I get someone who is doing, you know, kind of a virtual school, homeschool type, type option, um, if they're coming to me, it's usually because their first, second, third choice didn't work out. I'm going to do junior college for a year, then transfer, and hopefully there's a roster spot because, um, again, much like people said, you have to, and I think Danielle mentioned it, you don't know how many roster spots are available, so you need to ask. You need to inquire um, as they, um, both as a college coach and a teaching pro like Paul and Jim, I encourage parents and my, my students to reach out to the coaches. So they ask me for advice. You know, you're going, you're thinking of going to this school, reach out directly to the coach, tell them who you're, you know, what you're about. And if you're homeschool or traditional school, if you have a passion for tennis and of, of contributing to a team, um, it really, that, that is probably secondary. Danielle, can you tell what what pathway did you go through in your in your process when you were doing? School? I was traditional school. I mm -hmm. I think at the time too, homeschooling was quite new, too, or actually quite new to the tennis culture. It was almost as if most of the most of the girls that I grew up with they were they were going to regular school. I think maybe like a couple, um, maybe three or four I could think of in my head that actually did homeschooling but actually went back to traditional school uh, they mm -hmm. probably did homeschooling for for one year and then went back to traditional school yeah. um i know it's a lot more common now and it, it, it's actually interesting to see junior tennis having evolved like over the years so you have like little professionals actually they they take it so seriously and, and i just also wonder too like um is it for the best i don't know uh, but but speaking from my experience, having traditional school and having limited uh, tennis hours or, you know, not making tennis my second job at such a young age, I was so hungry to play when I was in college mm -hmm. and still so hungry to play now. Uh, but but then again, th th things have changed. The dynamic has changed. Um, so I, I, I would say, like like Evan said, it depends on the athlete too it depends how gung-ho they are about playing a sport is it is it really is the homeschooling being pushed on some on a on a kid because some people are telling that kid that they have potential or is it something they truly want to do and it, it's it's tough to advise i don't i'm not too mm -hmm. i'm not too sure which is the right or wrong way but it definitely has to depend on the athlete so because i know part of this question also had to do with is it tougher to attain access to to college from one mm -hmm. route or the other um so what i'm hearing from you guys i think as a group is that it kind of depends on mm -hmm. on the athlete depends on you know their their pathway of choice just to make sure that if you are doing the homeschool route that you are doing a route that has been approved by your program um or you know a general mass amount of colleges in general it's something that you have to do research on before you start but it sounds like there's no um there's no, you're not looking down on one route or the other when an athlete comes to you. It's just, it's just, you know, some things work better for other people and there's, you don't see it as coaches as, diff as different or worse, one being worse than the other. Yes, Jim? Um, there is, uh, and Paulus, I, I'm not so sure, Evan, if it impacts you, but uh, Paulus may impact you. It is more difficult to get in academically from if you're homeschooled. The standards of your SAT score and all that are actually higher, at least for us, for the students to come in. So that's something that the parents have to uh, take into account too. I think you need a higher SAT score um, and a higher GPA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it seems that a lot of the, the homeschooling programs have improved over the years too. So there's a lot more development there, um, a lot more like access to different majors in college. So it seems like the homeschool paths are kind of starting to update too and, and be able to follow those things. Um, 
And then I want to ask, uh, Danielle, when you played on the team, did you have how many people, like what was the balance of your team? Did you have any people that were international players or how many players usually are, you know, from, you know, American players versus recruited from elsewhere? Yeah, so we had one international player, Valeria Polito. I actually, I'm not too sure in terms of what the typical ratio is. You just kind of knew certain schools love to recruit foreigners and certain schools love to recruit like within their area. I know uh, in for USC, we, Richard and Wes at the time, they, they tend to recruit around Southern Cal. And then like you also if you go up to like Stanford and Berkeley, Stanford recruited a lot of Americans, maybe just like the top Americans. And uh, Cal ended up recruiting more foreigners. So it just like really depends, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then um, Jim, I know you also kind of have international players on your team. So there's also kind of a debate going on right now about, you know, should coaches be focusing more on recruiting American players versus international players and the makeup of the team? Should there be a cap for how many international players um, compete for a team? Um, how do you feel about that? And is, is, is there something to that? Or is, you know, it depends on the program and some programs, you know, are, are about the win and, and recruiting whoever it takes to get the win, other things. Right. Well, um, I mean, I was fortunate enough to get two five-star local kids uh, with Chris Papa and Ivan Smith signing last year, who probably should have went and played Division One. So I was fortunate to be able to grab them on the team. I mean, bucket list, and, and don't get me wrong, I love every one of my kids, and I've had predominantly an international kid for, you know, kids on my team forever, and I love all of them. They're like my own kids. But, I mean, a bucket list, I think, for being for being a coach and being in an American school, it would be great to be able to feel, I mean, if I could have a team of all San Diegans that could win a national championship, how awesome would that be, being able to cultivate the talent from the local market and be able to do it? It's just, you know, the, the, the pool of, of that talent level gets dispersed. There's just so many great programs in the program or, you know, throughout the country that it's, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to be able to pull that all the time. I'd love to have more Americans. I'd like to see more Americans getting an opportunity to play. Um, but in, in just in my past experience, there just haven't been that many available that willing to to play at a small NAIA school. And uh, and the beauty of having the international students is they have a tremendous work ethic. Uh, they are very coachable and uh, very appreciative to be here in the country to have an opportunity. So I, I don't, I mean, it doesn't pose any problem for me to have a heavy international uh, player team because you know, we're getting out of our practices everything that we want uh, out of it. And so, and it's great for my American kids to be able to see that work ethic because when you've got a, a kid coming out of a third world country that that's their only opportunity to get out of that situation, uh, to be able to come to America and play, they see the work ethic involved to be able to get to that level. So it works both ways. I, I like mm -hmm. it, I like the mix. I just tend to be a lot more heavy on the international side than the American side currently. Yeah, and then, um... Paul, can you start to, can you talk about when it is appropriate? Like when should I, cause of what I'm hearing now is that, you know, there's all these opportunities out there yeah. and it, it kind of depends, it depends on the, the student athlete and the parents to do more research. Cause obviously from what Jim said, there's lots of opportunities that sometimes that athletes just aren't seeing. Um, can you talk about when the right time is to, you know, in, in your opinion, to do that kind of research and start reaching out to coaches? Yeah, at each division, you know, there there are um, regulations about um, when you can contact different coaches. Um, for the most part, at the small college level, um, those restrictions are relaxed. So I I tend to get a lot of emails and a lot of inquiries uh, from sophomores in high school, um, and that's usually a good time to start the process and to to start doing your research and development. Um, you know, that process becomes much more focused uh, through the junior year and the summer between junior and senior year. Of course, uh, you're trying to identify who might be in your in your front row, so to speak. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, I think I think uh, tennis players are very lucky in this day and age in that they have um, some tools at their disposal that uh, that weren't available, you know, a decade to 15 years ago. You know, Danielle talked about uh, when she was being recruited, it was all about tennis recruiting. I can remember when that was a new thing. 
Um, now in the last couple of years, uh, we live and die by uh, UTR and that's a tremendous uh, research skill for, you know, a uh, research tool for, for uh, recruits to use to know where they might fit um, and how they might project and, and, um, and what's the right fit and what program could work for them. Uh, but yeah, to, the short answer to your question is uh, freshman, sophomore year in high school, that's when you should start getting into gear and, uh, and start identifying what the, the universe of possibilities looks like. Great. And then I have two more questions. So Evan, can you kind of quickly summarize, obviously in tennis, we're playing singles and doubles. Is doubles something that you look for in players or is it something that juniors should be focusing on more than they are maybe currently? Sure. Um, I think when it comes to um, chemistry on a team, uh, I learned this from, I think it was my first uh, college coaching job ever about 15 plus years ago. I was an assistant at a D2 school and the head coach said, don't recruit anyone that doesn't know how to play doubles. And mm -hmm. because um, it's not so much at the junior college level, because uh, we do we get a point for every doubles win versus um, the higher levels. you got to get that doubles point. And Danielle knows how important that is. Amanda, you know how important that is. Everyone knows how important that is for the momentum of the match. Um, so doubles is huge. Um, I think the last couple of times I've talked to various college coaches, specifically, uh, well, men and women, is the, the missing component it, for recruits that they're hoping they have when they get on campus is a lack of, of net play and, and confidence at the net. Um, I even talked to a former um, Division One standout when I was doing an Instagram live interview recently, and they were said, when I got there, I thought I was good at doubles, and I really wasn't, I wasn't anything special. And by the senior year, you know, they're, they're winning everything uh, because they put that focus on doubles. So yes, they need to be have a stronger focus on doubles. I think that just adds to the um, the attractiveness to be recruited and makes you more marketable as a student mm -hmm. athlete. Um, and again, it's 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 super important at all levels, but I think especially important um, where doubles is just one point. Right. And then kind of to wrap it up, um, Danielle, you're obviously kind of the the college tennis dream. You had a very successful career at USC. You got to continue playing tennis after USC, and you're you know now having success uh, playing tennis professionally. You've even written a book reflecting on 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 college tennis called "The Invaluable Experience." Um, but to summarize, why do you think it is important for athletes at any level, if you play tennis, uh, to whether it's tennis on campus all the way up to kind of the level that you've gotten to? Why is it really important? For, for athletes to continue their tennis experience in college? Wow, that's a loaded question. There's so much to it. Uh, but if I, were to, if I were to sum it up, I feel that, and we've talked about this before, at, at the age of 17, 18, e even at 16, for you to decide that tennis is going to be the rest of your life and you're going to be successful at it, it's it's a really tough decision and um and my, maybe even a premature one at at that age um having not been exposed to to other facets in life i feel like i feel like when you go when you go and you compete at a university you, it gives you exposure to other things in the world other other avenues of of life different types of careers different topics maybe um maybe you acquire a dream that you want to be a lawyer when you get to school and you just didn't have that. You weren't able to, you know, dream that up while you were competing during like junior tennis. Um, and there's, and on top of all that competing alongside teammates with your coaches, it really builds you up to, to grow emotionally and mentally. And for sure, with without the college experience, I don't think I would have been able to make it on tour. Um, speaking from experience, at the age, if I decided to turn pro at 16, 17 years old, I 
I don't think I had the emotional intelligence in order to, to, to survive, especially with how tough the tour is now. Um, and, and I'm experiencing it firsthand and, and all, all the bad weeks, the bad months, the bad slums, uh, coupled with a few good wins here and there, it, it's tough stuff. And it's tough for, for any teenager to deal with unless you're an actual phenom. So I, I really do encourage people to go through that college experience to, to grow and mature mentally and emotionally and, and have, and have other people around you like help you grow too instead of you doing it all by yourself um so for me it's it's an amazing place to develop wh whatever school you go to um it's a great place to develop and after you're exposed to all these different avenues that you could possibly pursue and you still want to choose tennis i think you are in a better position to make that big decision after your four years at school so um we're in a better position than you were maybe when you were 16 17 years old some people think oh like these four years i, I just should have just cut to the chase um, but but that's not true and i think when you finish college it's it's almost like you you weed and you want to be a professional you weed out all the things and and you just know you gave everything else a chance emotionally to see if you wanted to do something else but if you truly want tennis it'll it'll be there for you and and it's it's definitely not a waste of time to develop in in college. So um, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Danielle. That's a great answer. That's 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 just the I was looking for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I I know I don't want to take up you know obviously you guys have all donated a, a fair amount of time to us tonight. I want to thank you so much to all our coaches and specialists for participating. I again want to thank. USTA SoCal for sponsoring this event. I hope it will be very informative to players and coaches about the college tennis experience. Um, so we'll be looking out for this. Hopefully we'll be posting this on via YouTube, social media. Uh, USTA SoCal has you know a whole new part of their site coming that will be dedicated to things like this. Um, so we hope that you check it out. Um, thank you again for watching and thank you again to my panel. Have a great night, everybody. <laughs>